Okay, my presentation is in two parts. Okay, um, part one is I'm going to present some initial findings about what I've discovered about the dynamics of change in Asia. What's the difference in practicing it here um, to that of the West? Um, I've got a lot of research, but I'm going to concentrate on one area. Um, part two, I'm going to actually introduce. Um, I mentioned earlier, my framework approach to change, which is uh, which is something I've developed over many years, um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in part two. So, that's part one, dynamics of change in Asia. Um, just to give you an idea of how I conducted the research initially, it's very rough and ready, there's no, uh, there's no sort of academic background to the way I research it, I've just asked a lot of questions. So, I established um, from members of my Change in Asia group, which is a LinkedIn group I run, um, and other LinkedIn contacts, what the main challenges were to practice the change and transformation in Asia. Okay. Collated all the responses, um, from which I established 15 main challenges. Gave agreement from all those people that actually input to that uh, initial research, to say, does this list of 15 represent the full list in, 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 in context of what you think. Um, I then sent emails to Change in Asia group members and LinkedIn first connections, and I'm sure there's plenty, quite a few people here today that are actually input to my research, so thank you very much, um, asking them to rank their top six in order of importance. And of those top six, I then assigned scores to the top six, as an example, six points for number one challenge, down to one point for the number six challenge, to ascertain the level of importance. So uh, that was a research measure methodology, very simple, very rough and ready. Um, I mentioned the 15 dynamics, I think it'd be a very good idea just to go through what those 15 dynamics are. First one is religion, central to the beliefs and ways of doing things in Asia. Pace of change. Um, so there's some question about whether it's slower in Asia. Some people have actually said, well, it's actually faster because of the way the region's developing and so forth. But initially it was uh, around slower. Reasons for resistance. There are different reasons for resistance change here in the region as there are in the West. Uh, change awareness, actually understanding the need for change is less prevalent here in Asia. Cycles and times, which means um, hours and days, Monday to Friday, Sunday, Monday, and Saturday, Sunday. Not so as important as in the West, so the seven day week here in the West is five days, and that's it, you know, nine to five, that's it. Um, families. Yes, um, Asia is heavily focused on the family unit, indigenous knowledge, more focused on the output rather than the process, which is true. Um, being a process person as well, that uh, doesn't sit quite right with me, but it works. Um, group focus, more focused on groups and individuals, cultural integrity and understanding of the Asian way of life, inter country obligations, less so in Asia than in the West, although that might change once uh, the Xi'an starts up in 2015. Um, Consensus, the need to understand and engage at all levels. Regulatory environment, not as strict as in the West, again, some people argue against that. Education, less creative. Hierarchy, uh, bosses in Asia find it harder to let go with empower their staff. And lastly, responsibility. The Asian staff find it difficult to express their opinion until the boss, the boss has and then they all agree. So those are the 15. In terms of the first 15, as I said, I mentioned um, that I, I then asked people to rank their top six and their side scores to them. So what I did was I got now a, an overall Asian average. That means from all the people like Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, um, some from India, Pakistan, etc., uh, which I regard as Asia. And effectively, the top six, number one, came out as hierarchy. Two, change awareness. Number three, responsibility. Number four, cultural integrity. <coughs> number five, education. And number six, consensus. Okay. Interestingly, I've now, because we have mainly a Thai audience, okay, I've drilled that down to Thailand, so I've stripped out Thailand from Asia. And we have a slightly different um, result. So, number one, actually change awareness. The awareness of the change. Then we have number two, number one of the Asian is one, which is 
by an option. And we have three joint number threes. One for cultural integrity, three education, responsibility, and then lastly, religion. What I'd like to do now is concentrate on the big one up there, which is change awareness. Okay? And interestingly, um, if you do a comparison of the results I got from Western consultants who work in Asia and from Asian consultants excluding Thailand and then the Thailand average, you can actually see that change awareness is a big deal here in Thailand. Yeah, very big deal. It stands out quite categorically. Yeah. What I'd like to do now is concentrate on that specific area. So, if awareness, change awareness is an issue here in Thailand, how do you get over it? How do you actually um, um, attack it, basically? First of all, I'd just like to explain what my view are, is of change awareness. What is change awareness? Change awareness is a person's view of the current state, where we are today. How they perceive problems. Their view of the credibility and trust of their leader. The misinformation and rumors that circulate. And the disagreement of the need to change. Change awareness is also to, it's about creating an understanding for the need to change. I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. Why is the change necessary? Why is it happening now? What's wrong with what we're doing today, which is the really the normal question, you know, it works at the moment, why should we change? What will happen if we don't change? And one of the most important ones is what's in it for me? Yeah, what do I get out of this change? Because that's what in everyone's mind, the, 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 the organization doesn't matter. I want to know about me as an individual. Okay, moving on. So to create change awareness, I would say if you do that through the communication process, simple analogy. Um, so what do you do? You provide messages about the business today. What sort of messages? Current situation and the rationale for change. As an example, business issues and drivers have created the need for change. What are they? Competitive issues or changes in the marketplace. What's driving the change from external? Any customer issues, or are your customers happy with the service they get, with your product, etc. Financial issues, is the company in trouble financially? Yeah. Are you making a loss? Why are you making a loss? And finally, what might happen if the change is not made? So, here we are today. If we don't make this change that we're planning, what could happen? Well, we could go down the tube, we could go first, cut you know, it is, etc. Um, that was a message about the business. What about messages about the change itself? Very much a vision of the organisation after the change has taken place. Very important to try and look, look forward and say, here we are now, we make these changes, where are we going to be in 12 months, 24 months, or 36 months time? Very important that people need to have that vision. Um, scope of the change, what is it? Is it a process change? Is it an organisational change? Or is it just a technology change? I would say they all intermingle in every way. If one, one has an uh, impact on the other, which I'll be going into a little bit more detail in the next time. What are the objectives of the change? What does success look like? Very much linked to what's the vision of the future. How are we going to measure success in this change? The overall time frame in which to implement the change, how long is it going to take? Is it a six month short hit? Yeah. Is it 12, 18 months, 24 months as a project? Alignment of the change with a business strategy. So we've got this business strategy. How does this change, how does, how does this change we're proposing align with the strategy of the business? If your strategy is growth, how does the change align with what you want to do? How big is it? What's the gap between now and where we want to be? Yeah. Um, very important question. Who is most impacted by the change and who is least impacted? Any sort of change could have an impact on different departments, different uh, parts of the organisation. Some areas are going to be more impacted than others. How does it look like? 
and the basics of what's changing, how and when, and also what is not changing, very important question. Yeah. We're always saying change, 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 but you know, it might be an idea to say to people, well actually, we're not going to change, this department's not going to change, that takes the pressure off some of And what about the messages about the impact of the change? So we've had the business today, we've had the previous slide, I don't know what the previous slide is, don't mind. Messages about the impact. So what is the impact of the change on the day-to-day -day activities of each stakeholder group? We've got a number of stakeholder groups, they want to know on how is it different for them? What's the impact? As I mentioned earlier on, what's in it for me? Uh, from an employee's perspective, very important. I'm the one that's working here. I've been working here four, five, six, ten years. How is it going to impact me? What's it going to do to my job? Is my job going to change? And so forth. Implications of the change of the job I mentioned on job security. Very much aligned to what's in it for me. How, am I going to, after this change, am I going to have a job afterwards? Or is my job going to change? And what behaviours do we expect from employees? Um, about how they're going to support the change. And, um, what do we expect them to do? We expect them to attend meetings, expect them to focus, attend the focus group, um, input into any process changes, how we do organisational changes. How, is, how do we get the employees to actually get involved? Feedback, different ways of providing feedback about the change. So we're giving people information, let's get some information back from them about how they want, what they feel, what they think, what they see, if they have any good ideas, so maybe you really have any good ideas come from people. Um, procedures for getting help and assistance during a change, one of the aspects often missed, people are going to walk around, they're going to think about the things that are going on, what's happening and so forth. They want to, they want to know about, if they want to ask a question, how they get an answer, where do they go to? And finally, the expectation that change will happen, and that is not a choice. If you actually, uh, if you actually set up a change initiative and you're going to do it, it's not a choice anymore. This is going to happen for you. It's yeah. very important to actually uh, put that message over. Um, so we've talked about the different messages. I just going to very quickly run through this about uh, the different channels we can use for actually. Uh, providing those messages. So I'll split it into face-to-face -face channels, which is probably the most important, what people like doing business face-to-face, -face, just like I like speaking to the audience like yourself. Okay. Online is great, but it's great to be here and meet the people I've dealt with online. Okay, face-to-face, -face, I'll go through this very quickly, departmental meetings, uh, group meetings, focus groups, one-to-one -one meetings, one shows, team meetings, workshops, and other other um, channels of building awareness of the face-to-face. So now we're talking about some of the online media, um, talk about emails. Why don't people answer emails? Um, notice boards. Frequently asked some questions, leaflets and posters, social media, we'll talk about social media as well. Uh, project newsletters and website internet presence. So very, very simple. I mean you probably know most of all these anyway, but I just thought I'd put them up just for that information. But what is important is that the channel should be carefully selected based on the timing and the impact of the messages on the audience. And what I said before, employees both prefer face-to-face -face and out and actions for large impact changes. Um, just to reinforce the message about awareness, um, I don't know whether anyone's heard of Crosby. Crosby and uh, Cotter are probably the two most renowned names in the change management world. Um, Crosby had a thing called ADCAR. Yeah. And ADCAR stands for, I'm not going to tell you what the A stands for you, but you might guess. Desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. Um, the A stands for awareness. So the first rung of that ladder, the PROSCI, is change awareness, making people aware of that change. 
So if you then look at how that works in, in, the, in, the, in the time and level of commitment continuum, awareness is the first level, okay? And awareness, Prosky says, awareness is uh, uh, the need for change and understanding the impact of the change in the organization and your specific group. So awareness is the, actually the first building block for that change process. So that very much ties in with the issue here I laugh about making people aware. aware that awareness is the key and using those different uh, communication channels, the messages, etc., is how to bring that bring that over. Okay, that's the first bit. Okay? That was okay for you. Right, I'm gonna go very quickly through my very here <laughs> approach to change. It's a framework approach, it's something I've developed over the last 15 years. Um, it works, I've used it in many uh, assignments before. Um, what I will say about it is a modular approach. And what that really means is it can be used in its totality, so you can actually have the framework in its totality, or you can pick and choose any module you want, depending on what the change initiative is. So if you only want process, or if you only want organization, or whatever, you just take module stories. And you can actually, actually take secondary modules from the main modules rather than secondary modules. Again, what it also means, it has implicit in the framework is the people side of change. So whilst it's a very linear uh, process focused framework, there are some soft factors within it. So creating an environment for change, very important, yeah, and that comes back to our awareness thing. Um, managing change resistance, very important. Yeah. Managing those people to say we don't want this, we want it to go away, speak to somebody else. Engendering change behaviours, what that means is trying to get people behaving in a certain way in relation to the change initiative. How does it work? What, again, I think I mentioned before, how do we want you to act? Yeah. How do we want you to support the change? And the key one here, uh, addressing organisational culture. Each organization has a, its own culture, even in the country. So having worked in the UK predominantly, every organization I went to, each had a different culture, completely. I mean, and I worked across different industry sectors, and it was amazing. So even in financial services, banks, buildings, and such, each one had a different culture. You had to understand that culture. You had to learn about it, because it's how you then perform within your role um, that impacts how people uh, right, so on to the framework. Framework is very much underpinned by the communication and stakeholder management. I don't do anything unless those two aspects are done properly. First, they are my first two modules. Um, then, within that, we have process changes, organisation changes, training and education, <coughs> business readiness, business benefits, and continuous improvement. Process change, the process change module uh, contains creating a hierarchy, defining the assets, etc. I'll go into a little bit more detail about it in a bit. I'll just click through this very quickly. There are outputs from each of these modules. So the output from the process changes are changes from the assets and the to, to, to be and what is the business impact as a result of that. Organisation changes, the outputs from that are new jobs, roles, responsibilities, and a new organisation design. Training and education, outputs from that are competency, proficiency, and knowledge. So you train people to use whatever, to develop new processes, etc. Business readiness, an often forgotten part of change. Um, the outputs from that are business readiness and a go live assessment. Are we ready to go live with these technology changes or programs? Business benefits management is um, it's about creating a benefits plan and key performance indicators which are aligned to the business case. And continuous improvement, which is once all the changes are done, do we continue to change? Yes, we do. And the output from that has a, set, a successful improvement and a continuous cycle. What I'd like to go do now is go into a little bit more detail about the process, organisation, training, education, and business readiness changes. 
So the stakeholder, my stakeholder management module contains four elements. Identify, define, engage, and plan. So identify all your impacted stakeholders. Um, we, we talked about stakeholders earlier on. Try and identify who they are, how they're impacted, etc. Okay. Then define their stakeholder map and the groups they sit in. Which sort of groups do they sit in? Um, and that, interestingly, that comes back to one of the issues here um, on the um, um, dynamics that I mentioned earlier on about hierarchy. Yeah. How do you actually create a stakeholder group in a hierarchical organisation? Yeah. Given that some people might not speak up, you know, they're not present. That's something I'm looking at. Um, engaging with the stakeholders, very important. Start talking to them, start engaging with them, ask them numerous questions about what they feel about the change and so forth. And then, based on that, you'll plan your stakeholder communication through the communication process. Which leads me on to, oh, sorry, all stakeholders need to be identified and engaged with their support by you. Okay, I mentioned communication. Um, communication uh, module contains four elements. They all seem to contain four elements. Um, four elements are messages to be communicated. We talked about some of the messages earlier on. Um, channels to be communicated through. Again, we talked about some of the channels earlier on. Stakeholder groups to be communicated to. Individuals, environmental groups, weapons groups. of communication, how often do these people want to hear about things. Some stakeholder groups will want to hear about things on a weekly basis, some people want to hear about things on a daily basis, some people say don't bother me unless it's something of interest and then send me an email. Um, moving quickly on to the process change module, um, first element is actually creating a process hierarchy. So you need to understand how, how what your processes look like. Um, the, level, the levels here are probably uh, irrelevant, but uh, I, I work on six levels, other, other organizations work on different levels. So level one is the main business area, okay? Level two is the process group within, those business, within that business area. Level three are the business processes within the process group. Uh, level four are the business sub-processes to the business processes. Level five is the actual process step, so how does it work from A to B? And level six is the detailed procedures. So the written word, how do these process, what do I need to do, when do I need to sign that for, when do I need to send that form to? Having created the process hierarchy, then you need to define what your as is processes look like. Okay, where are we today? What do these processes look like today? Um, from that you then decide how design how your processes look like. What do, we want to look, what do we want them to look like? How do they become more efficient? The difference between the two is the impact analysis. Okay, so you have what your as is, you've got it to be, what's the difference between the two? Right here are your major impacts. Um, organization change module. Um, some overall considerations, first of all, and there are four. You have reporting lines, working practices, job design, and management systems. Within reporting structures, you've got things like what are your overall team structures, the locations of core functions, reporting lines, rating structures, staffing numbers, what are their spans of control? Within working practices, you have an intra indirect or matrix reporting structure, layout and location of departments, meeting committee structures, teamwork, interaction, how does that work, problem resolution processes, flexibility and multi skilling. Um, job design, roles and responsibilities, I don't know if more detail on the next slide about that. Skills and competencies required, you've got empowerment, accountability, and decision making processes. And what I mean by management systems is you have any form of performance management uh, in place, reward and recognition systems, continuous improvement, and career progression. A lot to consider. Okay. In terms of organizational design, I mentioned roles and responsibilities. Very really quickly go into um, what, we, what I mean by that. So we have role description and mapping, job impact assessment, 
job description and design, and organizational change and design. In terms of the general role description and mapping, that is about creating a roadmap for managing all of the job changes. The purpose of that is to identify what jobs will be impacted in which part of the organization, and determine what new knowledge and skills are required by the people. Job impact assessment is determining how the implementation will impact jobs. So this is what we're doing, how will it impact. And the purpose of that is to understand how related job role changes will impact employees, and input to the creation of a strategy to address employee impact, how we actually address this, how we talk to the how we, how we tell the jobs change. Now, job description and design, that's defining the changes that need to occur to job roles for each new and modified job role. The purpose of that is to define the task needed to successfully accomplish work and provide input to job evaluation. And finally, organizational design, to serve to determine the nature of the changes of the organization, the big picture. Yeah. And the purpose of that, obviously, is to provide a design of the new organizational structure so everyone can see where they sit in the new scheme of things, and prioritize the needs and address the most critical organization issues first. Where is the biggest impact? We need to go there first because that's where all the job roles are changing, that's where the structure is changing most. Training and education. Um, people, again, we have a um, We need to consider the goals and the objectives of the training. Obviously, if it's a change in implementation, the goals and objectives are related to that. Um, the competencies and skills you want to train on. If it's a technology implementation, ERP, as an example, you want to, you need to train people on their input skills in particular, in particular part of the ERP. Uh, the ERP uh, um, the actual jobs and tasks they do, what are they going to be doing? And obviously, the individuals that are going to be trained, who are they? What they look like? I mentioned earlier on, some departments may be impacted, some might not. Those are hard to be um, There's also some major logistical issues when we're talking about training. Um, again, sometimes overlooked. Um, Training needs to be aligned to the rollout, so it could be big bang, it could be phase or whatever, and that has an impact on how you train your employees. If it's a big bang, you've got a big issue around training. Um, the numbers to be trained, I mentioned this earlier on, how many people are there to be trained, can they be split into groups, etc. Um, training delivery options, how do we deliver this? Can we do classroom training, can we do e-learning, on the job training, and we do cascade training. Again, you need to consider the best way that works within your organization. People know you um, Training documentation, again, very important aspect. Um, for me, training documentation comes from your process design. Okay? And that it, it, it looks like training guides, procedures, and user guides. So people have something on their desk to help them with their, their of the example And train, the specific tra training logistics is around premises and technology. For example, we're going to use a, a hotel uh, on this place. <laughs> um, not to be overlooked because it, it does have an impact on, 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 your, on your training plan. Um, staffing backfill. What do, you do, what do you do about your day-to-day -day work that's going on when people are being trained for a week on whatever? Do you backfill? Do you have people working in their roles, doing what they used to do while they're being trained? And finally, cost impact. How much is it going to cost to train these people? Unfortunately, training is one of the things that always gets pushed back to the end of the change initiative. Yeah? It's the one thing that says, because it comes at the end, they say, no, We'll do that in five days, or then it becomes three days, and then it becomes two days. But it is absolutely an important part of the whole process. Um, finally, finally, business readiness. I mentioned earlier on that this is an often forgotten part of business change. Um, and I always, I always like to measure how ready the business are in relation to when we're at a particular time in the change life cycle. So 
the approach is, let's agree how we do that. Do we use a bespoke approach that is specific to the organization? Or can we, uh, can we use Crossley's ad card and measure on that continuum I mentioned, so awareness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've actually used that, but that's quite powerful. Uh, you turn in a readiness target. So normally you would measure by a number of questionnaires and they would score questionnaires. So if it's a score of one to five, meaning one, we're not ready, five, we are. What's your target you're after? What is it? Is it four point five? Is it four? Whatever. Um, determine the questionnaire style. How do we send out the questionnaire? Can it be survey monkey? Can it be Excel? Very, very simple. Um, and agree questionnaire frequency. Do we do it every week, every month, or whatever? Depends on the length of the change we should do. Um, areas and questions. We need to determine the key measurement areas. Um, key measurement areas are things like leadership, or um, not, um, process and change, uh, process or information, organizational information, um, uh, data, etc., etc. I can't go into detail on that, but there are specific areas you can measure. Okay. You need to formulate the questions, and the questions will be formulated in agreement with the stakeholders, because they're the people that are going to ask the questions, they're the people that are going to get the information at the end of the day. Um, measure and monitor, so the mission that you, you determine how you're going to do it, you uh, put the questionnaires, you need to actually issue the questionnaire to stakeholders, obviously get feedback, and analyze and prepare the results. And then, key, prepare the communication, issue the results, and discuss the results with the key uh, stakeholders, and implement any change interventions necessary to try and bring back those areas that are looking like they're lagging back up to speed or back up to the target you're trying to achieve. Some people thought we were crazy, but I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> was over 15 days ago, Max! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. <laughs> we're getting more from our employees than ever before. You know you need a cup of tea or the TPS reports, Richard? Daddy, you baby! Hey, Hey, Janice! But what's really impressed me is how Terry's become part of the Felcher family. He fits right in here. This is no more business call, To be honest, I wish Reebok sent us 10 Terry takes. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the floor? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. 
Pascal inside because obviously we want to rationalize and uh, get synergies and uh, in downsizing organizations uh, it's very very tough in this environment so if anybody can help shed some light on that would be appreciated. change if, if, the, if the impact is negative. Um, I think it goes back to the question of making people aware of what the change is, what is going to happen, how it's going to happen, etc. It's not going to um, change their mindset, let's say, but at least, at least they're going to get information up front about what's happening and what the impact is of that. Um, it's a difficult one to manage, to be honest. Um, and, uh, I mean, I've been in... Um, was involved in a uh, project in the UK for the uh, network rail, the um, UK's network rail provider. And there were a number of job losses involved. And um, the, way, the way we actually, <laughs> program manager didn't want to um, communicate the fact. As a change manager, I said we need to communicate the fact. We need to make these people understand what exactly is on the line here. Yeah. Um, we uh, encountered a lot of resistance to start with um, because obviously it was bad news and we did this by a face-to-face -face communication by the way. We did a lot of road shows, a lot of visits to centres and so forth. Um, and we eventually, um, I didn't turn the people around, but we eventually got them talking and we eventually had them um, involved in the process because it was an amalgamation of a number of record centres into a single centre. So we needed them to actually help us with what we were doing. And it was purely through the communication process that we actually got them involved and to understand what the impact was. And then, obviously, HR being involved in, involved in terms of the job losses and so forth. Um, and to a certain extent, not saying that uh, they were uh, their, their jobs were safe, but that HR would look for alternative roles, etc., etc. So very much engagement, very much communication. We're going to have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Ron, the, the first uh, question is very difficult to overcome, the awareness to change. Uh, you can see the recent example in Thailand, the waterfront. Even though everyone knows that disaster is coming, but what they do aware to change or uh, they start, you, you can see the example that uh, half of the people do not move out of their house, even though that they know that the disaster is coming and the waterfront is coming. Uh, how you think to aware? Uh, how you think to address uh, on your opinion on this one? If people, need, if people want to ignore you, unfortunately, um, yeah, that's one of the downsides of, of change. But um, the way I've dealt with it in the past, and whether that works here, is to continue to engage, continue to make them aware, to continue to communicate. Yeah. Um, only by doing that will they, what, what would hope they will eventually, yeah, get it ingrained that this change is going to happen. Yeah, you can't shut it out forever, um, and you know, it's, it's it's a difficult one where people just want to close their eyes, turn their back on change, etc. Um, and, and these are the classic change resistors. Um, there is a uh, a notion that um, you some people say if if they become a complete change resistor, you should bypass them and work with the people that, uh, that are change, uh, that are happy with the change, willing to work with you. I don't come from that school of thought. I prefer to meet change resistors head on. I prefer to try and um, talk to them about getting to understand and, and work them around because often what happens is the biggest resistors become the biggest champions once they turn around. 
they become the champions of change in the end. And again, an example, I work for, I did a lesson government work um, in the UK many years ago, and there was one area that completely resisted. They said, we're not gonna do this, we're, we just we just haven't got time, we're not interested, we think, we think the system you're implementing won't work, etc." So I actually met the head of department on a face-to-face -face basis, I attended his team meetings, I engaged with his, with his individuals, his, his subordinates, etc. I spoke to them, I told them how it was done, I even showed them how it was done personally. And eventually, they, that department, that area, became the, the main champions of what we were trying to do. They were the ones that populated the system with information and so forth. So meeting them head on, absolutely key, I think. It, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you try to bypass them, it doesn't work because they will still resist and they will still till talk to other people about that resistance and it doesn't help. If you can switch them, people will then look and say, ah, he used to resist or she used to resist, but now look, they, they, are, they are supportive of the change. It means a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, but I think it's worthwhile. Okay, I think we'll have time for one more question. Hi everybody, Savio Barbosa from Singapore. Uh, I've had a lot of change, my uh, experience implementing change across Asia, and I'm a strong believer in measuring success, so especially around the organizational change and KPIs and the questionnaires. Um, my experience, um, well, the difference I see from what you say in the US or in Europe, and the difference in Asia is a lot of the times I don't believe the measures that come back to you. And there are various reasons. Um, measures of success that you put around it, um, some of them are not very believable. Uh, in Asia, I tend to see people say yes as an answer to a question when they really mean, I don't know, or I you know, no. And then things like when you have a red, amber, or green status on a KPI or a measure of success, people are afraid of putting a red afraid of putting an amber, they tend to say everything is good, everything is going on track. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? <laughs> I'll admit, having not experienced any change in Asia myself, um, I've read about it, I've researched it, I understand the issues around people actually say, okay, this is a question, I will just put okay, or middle of the road, or yeah, we're happy, whatever. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, Again, um, uh, this might be kind of boring, but I would say it's it's actually getting back to that engagement process, the initial engagement process with the stakeholders. Those people that are going to uh, you're going to ask to answer the questions and to try and get them to understand that by answering them honestly <laughs> um, is the only way that you're going to be able to measure success. Um, but I don't know. It's a short answer. Ah, George is going to cover it later. There we go. Well <laughs> okay. Um, that's fantastic, Ron. Uh, that's a very interesting introduction to the Business Dynamics Forum. Um, what I'd like to do now is to congratulate and thank Ron for his uh, contribution today. And then we will go out for a short coffee break. If you have any further questions, then please feel free. I'm sure Ron will be happy to uh, answer on a one-to-one basis. Okay, thank you very much, Ron.